Hello, everyone. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeremy Alden Tesser, Muhlenberg Stanley Road Professor of Neuroscience and the Chair of the Neuroscience Department. Growing up in Fresno, California, Jeremy received his Bachelor of Arts from Williamette University, studying English and biochemistry. His senior English thesis was entitled The Woman Stripped More Nakedly Than Nakedness, The Taxonomy of Femaleness and the Poetry of Wallace Stevens. Afterward, Jeremy received his PhD in neuroscience from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Under the direction of Dr. Cynthia Joukowsky, Jeremy played a prominent role in mapping the benzodiazepine binding sites on the GABA-A receptor. Jeremy then went on to receive his postdoctoral fellowship in pharmacology at Emory University under the direction of Dr. Randy Hall. Prior to coming to Muhlenberg, Jeremy spent a short time as an adjunct professor at Oglethorpe University a small liberal arts college in Atlanta, Georgia. Jeremy joined the Muhlenberg family in 2003 and has had an immense impact on this institution. William James may arguably be the father of neuroscience, but for many of us, Jeremy is our father of neuroscience. <laughs> Remarkably, Jeremy's teaching is not solely confined to neuroscience. He has taught non-major and specific topics courses such as drug science, multiple Dana FYSs related to bodies and language, the state of China, and bodies of knowing. Without a breathtaking teaching, with a, ooh, with a breathtaking peach, teaching pedagogy, Jeremy captivates the classroom, catalyzes dialogue, and challenges the normative. Dr. Jeremy Tesser is the professor every parent wishes their child had in college. Using humor as an engagement tool, Jeremy fills each classroom with laughter and surprise. During the neuroscience queue, Jeremy said, and I am quoting, I am a sleep talker. I lecture in my sleep. One time I said, and this neurotransmitter should be called Fred Savage because it's a social butterfly. Real quote, real quote. Because of his memorable and groundbreaking teaching abilities, Jeremy has received the Muhlenberg ARC Bridge Building Award 14 times in a row, the SGA Award for Outstanding Student Mentorship, and the Paul C.M.P. Memorial Award for Excellence in Teaching. He even received the Creative Pedagogy Research Grant Award with Professor Holly Kate and Professor Ann Esikov. In addition to teaching, Jeremy's leadership roles on campus are many. Jeremy's the chair of the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, director of Muhlenberg College's Brain Camp, co-director of the annual Center for Ethics program last year? with Dr. Kathy Ouellette, entitled Sex, Ethics, and Pleasure Politics, and has been, dedicated, has been a dedicated member of the Diversity Strategic, Planning, Diversity Strategic Planning Committee. Jeremy is passionate about research and became a mentor for many undergraduate students. Through mapping the binding sites of the GABA receptor, Jeremy discovered how the drugs Ambien and Lunesta work. So you can thank him next time you can't fall asleep. With many research grants, Jeremy has written numerous publications, professional abstracts, poster sessions, and has mentored over 34 students throughout his 13 years in Muhlenberg. Outside of the lab, Jeremy has mentored thousands beyond thousands of Muhlenberg students. If you have ever spent a crying session in Jeremy's office, you know the power of his helpful guidance, kind words, and calming demeanor. He is truly one of a kind. To understand how special he is, here are some titles of presentations he has given about the molecular underpinnings of the GABA-A receptor. A fire-breathing she-go. The mad woman in the attic. Interactions in the underworld. And the molecular dissection of a tango. Those are all about a GABA receptor. Jeremy's creativity and scientific inquiry is inspirational. Nothing is ever boring with Dr. Jeremy Tesser. I am privileged to have grown as a scholar and person from Jeremy's teaching. We, as a senior class, thank you, wherever you are, for the wisdom, for the wisdom, love, warmth, and knowledge you have shared with all of us. You will forever have a place in our hearts. Please help me welcome my advisor, mentor, and dear friend, Dr. Jeremy Tesser.
Hi. You know, I hate graduation speeches. They're so patriotic and insincere. They're always working to reassure that it gets better, to seize the opportunity, to live forever. They're like Enya lyrics or a slogan from a bank and not even the very best bank. They're like a 2014 BuzzFeed listicle. You've seen it all before and yet you can't help clicking, can't help being marketed to by unseen forces of fantastical democracy, forces that seduce you into capitalist comfort, into speeding on the Merritt Parkway, into shopping and peeling out all over this land. Tonight I've given myself the impossible task of saying something honest and weird and true to you. And if it's a mess, I hope you'll forgive me. Frankly, it would be better if we all remain a little bit more confused. One of my favorite things about living is realizing just how fragile it all is. We really don't know what's going to happen in the next moment. And so we grope blindly forward into a future with an expiration date. We're just transactions, each of us, lucky transactions, and we're here so very briefly. I want to argue that the most effective use of our time, our privilege, if we're at all able, is to resist. Tonight's topics are faith and resistance. Here we are, in this liminal border moment, ritualizing the apparent end of a story you set into motion four years ago. It's a fleeting moment, these last few hundred paces before the bridge slopes back to land, disembarking down. If this were 2012, there you'd be, awkwardly walking the slope up from Seegers to Prosser, Prosser to Seegers, smaller and dumber and somehow more and less polluted, following a few vortical orbits around constant stars dragged along by time and swipes, caffeine and carbohydrates, you emerge as an accumulation of notebooks and pen marks and sna saved Snapchats. And if this were tomorrow, there you'd be, looking back at yourself, curiously, knowing something now, a day's knowledge, but knowing something the reality of the next few steps rather than their blind, ignorant pre-appraisal. Impossible not to notice the way it all fits so neatly into a story, this current but fleeting fear and ignorance. It gathers around your eyes like the folds of a subtle veil trapped in time. As Louis Menon famously argued in his commencement address, college helps us to learn that other people make tuna fish sandwiches differently than we do. <laughs> that there is no normative tuna fish sandwich only tuna fish contexts arranged hierarchically along tuna fish lines of power. <laughs> the challenge in front of you is to do something, become deeply curious about something, act on behalf of something, take responsibility to continue doing something, but not to become something, not to occupy territory and claim it selfishly as the provenance of you or put another way, to always be becoming, but not to be. Krishnamurti says, when you don't want to be somebody, when you don't imitate, when you don't follow, when you're in revolt against the whole tradition of trying to become something, that is the only true revolution. To cultivate this freedom is the function of education. That is, the function of education is the cultivation of resistance. Resistance to dogma, resistance to naturalizing your own assumptions, resistance to suburban lawns and a line at Dunkin' Donuts, resistance to replication. That's the implied question I'm starting with, and that's what I hope to leave you with. How will you resist the world's resistance to you? It's a constant effort to package a norm. Certainly real change can happen, but long arc bending toward justice and so forth, but how? What sorts of resistances are possible? How do you change seemingly permanent practices and beliefs? And when are we so inextricably bound up in the system that we can declare with our meat sack skin puppet mouth that we are made of ideology and time and mortal dust and therefore resistance is futile? The moving walkway is now ending. Please look down. Seven years ago, I was honored to give the last lecture to the class of 2009. 
Last month, when I was notified that I'd been again nominated, I was deeply thankful, and I thought I should look back at my notes from 2009. Were there lessons in there, stories I told that I could poach and reapprise this evening? Uh, looking for inspiration, I thought, maybe I can plagiarize my former self. In my defense, I am horrible at the tightly smug, as if not obvious, lessons from pop-pop style graduation speech at where hard-won advice is doled out, things like make your bed every day and everyone appreciates a thank you note, before the graduating class is empowered to go forth and be virtuous as there has never before been a better time to be alive. But as I looked back at the talk I gave in 2009, I realized that as material, it wasn't going to work at all. The class of 2009 graduated at the absolute bottom of the Great Recession. They entered a world of panicky economic fright, where jobs were scarce and golden parachutes were reserved only for the architects of this disaster. None of us in positions of mentoring had any practical, hard-won strategies to honestly provide. We hadn't experienced something like this ourselves when we had graduated in the 1990s, the age of signing bonuses, which was starting to look more and more like a giant hot tub of corporate subsidies, global capitalism, oversized clothes, Bill Clinton, and barbecue. <laughs> And earlier that year, President Obama's first inauguration had been synonymous with a si se puede optimism, a we can do it shining spirit, captured in Richard Blanco's inauguration poem, written entirely in the first person plural. The work of our hands, one country, all of us, facing the stars, hope together. That's his quote. And so I talked about honeybees and colony collapse disorder, about wandering in the desert for 40 years, about the wisdom of crowds, and how friends were really val valuable in telling you to sit the fuck down and do something. <laughs> but as this talk tank came together tonight, I realized that I was now arguing the exact opposite. <laughs> For these are darkly cynical days of overarching, suffocating systems. Systems of hierarchy and perpetual inequality, systems of fictive power and data algorithms, tyrannies of unconsent bulldozing the dispossessed and delivering a false democracy. Invisible, powerful, and seemingly unerasable. Can these systems be stopped? Can they be controlled or reformed? What kind of resistance for us will even be possible? How could one commit to becoming when systems have always already shaped our very becoming? Stand clear of the closing doors, please. <laughs> There's a story in an ancient book about the Hebrews called the Bible. <laughs> and this story takes place during the fifth century in Persia, about 450 years before Jesus' time. Now, what's really remarkable about this story, as many have pointed out, is that God isn't mentioned in it at all. The God of the earlier Bible, the one that was always showing up on people's front porch and saying things like, uh, listen, I'm destroying everyone, so uh, make yourself an ark out of some gopher wood and prepare for a really long family vacation. <laughs> this God is hidden, or silent, or missing. It's a story sprung from the absence of divine certainty. When the story opens, Persia is a seat of a diverse, wealthy empire spread across 120 countries from India to Ethiopia. Sounds kind of familiar. And King Xerxes sits at the center of this flourishing kingdom, adding, addicted to banquets and low gold and silver couches sumptuously placed on onyx marble floors. And it's a modern kingdom. All the king has to do is issue four.